Joining me now to discuss the Black Appalachian experience is author of The Harlan Renaissance, Stories of Black Life in Appalachian Coal Towns. Welcome, Dr. William Turner. Dr. Turner, I am so glad to have you on Amplified tonight. And I have to be honest that when I think about coal towns and, you know, when I think about, you know, Appalachia period, right? I think West Virginia, I think working class white people, uh, really, really poor white people, frankly, I don't think about a, a black presence there. So I would love for you to just start off sharing with us you know, what is unique about, about the black coal mining experience that so many of us didn't even realize was there. Well, you know, one thing about the uh, the overall learning we got from uh, the 1619 project, for example, is that there's so much about the American mosaic that we don't know. And despite the fact that African Americans were uh, were seen, if you will, in the very heart of Cherokee Nation in the Smoky Mountains, which is in Appalachia, in the 1500s. And so subsequently, the thousands and thousands of black people who worked in the coal industry in my home area called Harlan County, Kentucky, and I had relatives who were in Southern West Virginia around Beckley and Bluefield and Keystone, and people in Southwest Virginia. My great grandfathers were coal miners. Mm. So where were the black folk coming from who came to these uh, eastern Kentucky coal towns for work? Who, who were they? Well, uh, uh, one of the things that I like to do is draw the, the attention to uh, where did these thousands and thousands of black people come from whom we saw uh, comprise the, the population that came known as the Harlem Renaissance the Schomburg people, uh, 125th Street. Uh, and, and so where did those people come from? They came from along the I-95 corridor, of course, long before there was an I-95, and they came out of the deep south along the Atlantic coast. And they came up out of Florida and Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina and Virginia into Baltimore and Philadelphia, New York City and Boston by the millions. Mm. And the 1920s was the middle of the Harlem Renaissance. At the same time, thousands and thousands of black people were moving out of the Black Belt South of Central Alabama, around Jefferson County, Alabama, where Booker T. Washington had gone to. And Booker T. was from Huntington, uh, Charleston, West Virginia. And so that was a migration stream from what we call uh, Jefferson County, Birmingham, Inslee, uh, 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 hmm. several towns around Birmingham, because United States Steel, at that time, the largest corporation in the world owned Birmingham, Alabama, lock, stock, and barrel. It was called the Steel City. On the other end of that chain was Pittsburgh. They owned Pittsburgh, the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. My father always hated them because my father worked for United States Steel. And he said, they play those boys to play football more than they pay me to work in this damn hole. Excuse my French. So my point mm -hmm. is, the, the vast majority, 90% of the people in my grandparents' generations who moved into uh, the Appalachian Mountains of Eastern Kentucky and Southwest Virginia and Southern West Virginia and East Tennessee, having moved there between 1890 and 1930, they moved primarily from Central Alabama. And they came and into these little for... towns. No, no, go, well, go my ahead, grandparents, go ahead, gonna say? They... Anybody's grandparents, the age of myself, and as I said earlier, I'm 75, meant my grandparents were sharecroppers. So they were just, my grandma was born in 1896 on my mother's side. My grandmother on my father's side was born in 1894, which meant that their parents had been enslaved. So during so-called mm -hmm. Reconstruction, uh, Jim Crow era, these black people basically went out every day in Boss's Field and as grandma used to say, they looked up the south end of a northbound mule and they, they, they cultivated and they picked and they harvested cotton. And then uh, around mm -hmm. 1900, mm -hmm. many of them were able to leave and they went to be coal miners. Just as people came into New York, did whatever they did, those who went into, New into tell us, Chicago, tell us what uh, that, those who went west like. to California. Be 
Ma'am. So like you mentioned, you grew you you yourself grew up in in Lynch, Kentucky, like you've mentioned and and right. much of your family worked in the mines. And I, I I love the title of your book, The Harlan Renaissance because it's making this analogy to what we know as the Harlem Renaissance. I'm curious, what was it like growing up uh in that environment? Cuz I think, you know, poverty, you know, downridden uh in the coal mines, but it, but the way that you talk about uh the black community there, it sounds like it might have been more. Tell us about it. Yeah, I, you know, I see on your screen some of some photographs I've seen a thousand times in my life. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there were certain coal towns, uh, such as the one where I grew up, which was uh, operated by large conglomerates like United States Steel, as I can't say enough about. U.S. Steel at its time in the early 1900s was the equivalent of Amazon and and any big company you can think of. They owned the town and they built the town. It was a planned community. Uh, they brought in people from all parts of the country uh, for out of the South for black people, but they also brought people over Ellis Island who were European ethnics. They were Poles, they were Hungarians, they were Czechs. And I lived in one of the most diverse communities in the United States. When I was born in the mid forties, uh, our town had about 12,000 mm -hmm. people. and. Uh, 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 there were 38 different nationalities represented, 38 different. Right now, I live in Houston, Texas, which means there were more diversity where I grew up in Kentucky, in the mountains in the 1940s and 50s than you'll find in most cities in the United States right now. It was a very diverse place, and I never went to bed hungry. That's amazing. Because my father, yeah, my father went to the third grade. My mother went to the 10th grade. They married when she was 15. But my father was able to stay on a job for 51 years, and he raised 10 children like that. And it's hard nowadays to raise two children on, 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 a, on the kind of income he had, but it was steady, and, uh, and we all grew up there. It was, it was, quote, quite segregated. The school which I attended, uh, written in the concrete on the facade, was a Lynch-colored public school. Uh, my hometown was called Lynch, Kentucky. Uh, Lynch, uh, don't smirk too much, ma'am, but Lynch was the name I'm, of the yeah, owner of, of U.S. Steel. The man who owned the coal company, the man who owned U.S. Steel, his name was John Lynch. In many instances, these people named these towns after themselves. That's my high school right there. Up there beneath that flag, it says Lynch Colored Public School. That, that picture you're showing now, my grandmother's on that Sunday school class. That's where I went to school, right there. Wow, so there's this whole entire diverse community of people doing their thing. I'm just so interested in what then during this time were race relations like given the diversity and the connection point that everybody was really a part of the same company, if you will. I've often said, I've written it too, that inside a coal mine, everybody's black. So that when they come out though, it wasn't so much that way. It was just as segregated as any part of the American South. The African-American people lived, quote, in their communities. The whites lived in their community. There were some common social spaces, but in general, these were the stores. Uh, uh, but uh, when it came to schooling, when it came to recreation, when it came to our churches, when it came to any element of life, our fathers worked with white men, Hungarian men, Polish men, Czech men, or whatever the European ethics were. Uh, there was even a, a family we knew named very much named Camacho. So there were Mexican boys around where we grew up. Uh, but generally speaking, mm -hmm. it was it was just like any other part of the South, quite segregated. On the other hand, though, that segregation uh, created a condition where we grew up quite a autonomous in the in respect to the fact that we had teachers who had gone to Hampton and Tuskegee and Spelman and Wilberforce and Kentucky State, particularly where I grew up. And so we had uh, the best teachers right. money could buy because the company went out and hired all these people. And I have uh, documented in my own work that in terms of the uh, college going rate of blacks in my generation who went to these segregated schools, as they called them, we went to college at a much higher rate and we got more graduate degrees. Uh, I mean, I have nephews that went to Columbia oh, and to Stanford. 
So this is amazing. This is so awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing this context and history with us. I, I call it, you know, an unsung story that so many of us may not have known. The book is called The Harlan Renaissance Stories of Black Life in Appalachian Coal Towns. Make sure that y'all check this book out. Dr. William Turner, amazing man. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on Amplified and sharing with us.